Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to be here, and I hope you're all recharged after your coffee break. I know I definitely needed that. Um, I'll start with a quick review of my disclosures, which are listed on this slide here. And what I've been tasked with speaking about today is barriers and facilitators of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, uptake. Um, and it's a massive topic to try to do justice to in 20 minutes. So what I thought I would do is rather than give an exhaustive overview of the litany of concerns that we have about how challenging it has been to realize the full potential of PrEP, uh, instead what I'm going to do is, is review some useful frameworks that I think are useful for thinking about barriers and facilitators of PrEP. And uh, when I say that, I'm speaking about uh, PrEP uptake, PrEP persistence, as well as PrEP adherence. I think there's a lot of overlap between the barriers and facilitators. Most of what I'll be speaking about is, of course, uh, based on experience around the world that's been generated with existing oral forms of PrEP, so, so daily and 2-1-1 TDF-FTC, as well as daily TAF-FTC, uh, not so much yet about uh, depivirine vaginal ring in different settings, long-acting injectable cab, but of course all of these are really, really integral comp comp components of our PrEP armamentarium. And throughout, and I'm going to try to suggest uh, some specific actions that we as individuals, uh, whether you're a clinician, a researcher, another stakeholder as part of the uh, HIV response can play uh, as uh, in our efforts to increase PrEP use because it is really, I think, a travesty that any HIV infections continue to occur around the world when we have so many amazing and powerful and safe and effective tools for prevention. All right, so the very first uh, framework I want to uh, mention to you all is, is actually not so much a framework as just a metric. And I wonder whether you could put up your hand if you've heard of this metric, the PrEP to need ratio. Um, not very many hands going up around the world, I f uh, around the room, <laughs> uh, maybe around the world, I don't know. I first heard about this metric in this paper in the Annals of Epidemiology in 2018. Uh, and what it is, it's, it's a paper describing uh, how well one might be doing with the use of PrEP in a given population or jurisdiction. And it's simply a calculation where the numerator is the amount of PrEP use that's going on in your defined population, time period, uh, location. And then the denominator is a metric of need. And what, it's, what's, uh, what we use to operationalize that is uh, HIV infections in the same population, jurisdiction, and time period. Uh, ideally. Often that's not available, so you might use diagnoses as a bit of a proxy for that. But by looking at this number, this ratio, uh, you can get a sense of how, how, how much PrEP is going out relative to new HIV infections. And most importantly, by comparing this metric among comparable populations, you can get a sense of inequities in PrEP rollout. And a lot of this work has been done in the United States, uh, where there are gross inequities based on geography, uh, with a particular challenge in the southern United States as represented by these maps here, as well as by race and ethnicity. So uh, in the, the colors, you can see a, high, a darker color represents more PrEP uh, relative to HIV diagnoses, a higher PrEP to need ratio. Um, and overall in the United States, in this excellent abstract that was presented at the IAS Montreal meeting last year, you can see that uh, PrEP to need ratio in white Americans was 26 versus only three in black and six in Hispanic Americans. So really highlighting some of the inequities. There are some challenges and caveats to this metric, of course. Uh, first of all, um, the numerator consists of any PrEP use, right? So it's not distinguishing according to you know, the degree of underlying HIV risk that might exist in that population. So here, if you have, say, you know, some person who, a, a gay man, for example, who has had syphilis and rectal gonorrhea and is at really elevated risk of acquiring HIV, and then you have another person who has been consistently using condoms but is you know, uh, really excited about you know, the sexual liberation potential of, of PrEP, which we also support right, as clinicians. Uh, those are equally counted in the numerator here. So uh, obviously those different scenarios all have, both have merit clinically, but they're going to have different impacts on our uh, efforts to end the epidemic. So that's a, a limitation of this approach. Another important limitation is that the denominator, once again, ideally would be HIV infections, but that's something you can only really model as opposed to measure. So if you're using diagnoses instead, you need to be uh, aware of the difference between diagnoses and infections. In my jurisdiction where I work, uh, one of the challenges that we see is that we have a uh, with that metric is that we have a lot of folks who uh, move to Ontario, which is where I live in Canada, uh, with a prevalent HIV infection that had been previously diagnosed in another part of the world. And if that's the case, uh, then of course, 
rolling out lots and lots of PrEP in that population is not really going to prevent those infections, right? So that's a limitation. Uh, nevertheless, we've been looking at that in our uh, setting. These are some data from Ontario, Canada, and you can see that the PrEP to need ratio has been going up nicely in men. That's driven, of course, by work in gay, bi, and other men who have sex with men. But there's a gross inequity when we look at females. This is um, a, a sex assigned at birth as opposed to gender identity, which unfortunately we don't have uh, great administrative data on, but it gives you a real sense of, of inequities, and I think you can see how this metric can be useful in uh, measuring how you're doing with PrEP rollout in different settings. All right, uh, staying on the theme of PrEP in women, I came across this excellent review article that was really just published last week in the Lancet HIV, looking at barriers and facilitators of HIV PrEP in cis and transgender women, specifically in the United Kingdom. This is a review of both qualitative and quantitative studies that have looked at this uh, relatively um, understudied, I would say, population in many high-income countries, and Canada it's the same issue. And what these authors do is use the very popular socio-ecological model to kind of characterize the many different challenges that, that are facing uh, folks as we try to roll out PrEP, uh, which posits that you know, any kind of health issue is impacted by factors at the individual level, which are within, uh, in turn nested within social structures and social interpersonal relationships, which are in turn nested within broader structural and systemic uh, factors. I know you can't read the text there in detail, don't worry, I'm going to show it to you in a bit more detail in a moment, but I, I do think it's useful to just think about the socio-ecological model as another framework for understanding the different levels at which barriers and facilitators to PrEP can act. So here are some of the specific barriers and facilitators that that literature review uh, identified for women uh, and PrEP in the UK. And I think a lot of this is broadly applicable in other populations as well. So low PrEP awareness and knowledge is a fundamental problem that still exists even in mid-2023 uh, in many populations that could benefit from PrEP around the world. Likewise, even if someone knows that PrEP exists, they may not feel like it's for them because they may uh, feel that their risk for HIV is too low. This is an area, a problem that we see across clinical medicine of people not appreciating uh, risk in the same way that a clinician uh, might evaluate. They may have also concerns around the safety and efficacy of PrEP. It's, it's very, very common that people uh, voice some of these, and we'll come back to that theme in a moment. And then specific to transgender people, I think it's really important to note the concerns that may exist around gender-affirming hormone therapy and PrEP, which fortunately we now have decent data on, but it may be a driving fear that folks may have if they don't have sufficient access to that information. So, uh, many of the, these challenges are things, though, that I think can be at least in part addressed by something that's fairly low barrier and that we can all play a role in uh, advancing. And that is getting the message out about PrEP being a safe and effective uh, uh, choice for HIV prevention, recognizing that this is something that we need to uh, advocate for. Uh, putting it in a very positive light. Uh, in my uh, opinion, there's a lot of failure on the part of public health leadership around the world, um, in my, my country as well, in actively putting that message out there. You know, I think in contrast, we've just had a wonderful session about respiratory viruses, I think in contrast to um, what the public understands that public health authorities feel about COVID vaccines, it's unequivocal that we all know, everybody knows, that COVID vaccines are something we all want to advance. Uh, I don't think that everyone gets that message about HIV PrEP, but these are both highly safe and effective prevention options for different uh, serious viral infections. All right, at the community level, there's a lot of uh, factors that operate as well. Uh, again, this is applicable to many populations, not just cis and trans women in the UK, but stigma and discrimination are rampant. Uh, medical mistrust, uh, neg negative experiences of healthcare that people may have had in the past, as well as one-size-fits-all approaches. This is a common concern, especially with respect to women, where a lot of the marketing, if you will, uh, what, what, what that does exist for PrEP in high-income countries has focused on gay, bi, and other minority sex with men, such that people feel like, you know, PrEP is PrEP is a gay men's intervention, it's not for me. Well, um, there's lots that we can uh, do about that, and I, I want to share with you here uh, a quotation from a participant in a qualitative study that we did some time ago in Toronto uh, that I think captures some, not all, of these, of these sentiments. And I'm going to literally read this to you. Uh, this is a gay man, a young gay man, who said to the interviewer, I went through a sort of like bad part five years ago. I was just feeling lots of anxiety, and I knew it was because I was gay, but I'd try to spin it off to something else. So I went to my doctor, and I was like, I think I know why I'm so anxious all the time. And she's like, why? And I was like, I'm gay. And then she was like, I know lots of people that are becoming gay now. 
And I was like, oh, okay. So it just reminded me that a lot of doctors are not really well versed with dealing with people who are gay. It didn't come from a bad place from her. I just think it came from ignorance and that's why I never felt comfortable talking to her about anything else. I love this quotation because I think it encapsulates so much about what we know that people experience. In this case, it's related to their sexual identity. It could be related to so many other things and it really uh, ma makes it clear how much work we have to do to ensure cultural competence on the part of providers. It's an example of an interpersonal social uh, level at which uh, we can uh, work against a lot of barriers to prep uptake. Finally, at the structural level, there's a lot of concerns that were uh, raised in this paper. Uh, restrictive clinical guidelines, this is a common phenomenon around the world uh, where the criteria for uh, recommending PrEP to cis, and trans w well, cis women in particular may be somewhat nebulous. Um, and I think there's been some movement afoot in many guidelines around the world. The CDC in the, in the United States has tried to move away from uh, forcing risk-based assessments onto every single encounter and just advancing PrEP whenever someone self-identifies as thinking that it may be useful for them. Exclusion from clinical trials is a huge issue that I'll allude to in a moment, as well as the availability of PrEP services and access to care. So with respect to exclusion from clinical trials, I just want to point out this, this really nice viewpoint paper that was published uh, not that long ago. Where are the pregnant and breastfeeding women in new PrEP trials, the imperative to overcome the evidence gap? I think the title says it all. Historically, we have kind of uh, tried to protect, in quotation marks, uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women from research by ex actively always excluding them. Uh, and this is an argument to say, you know, perhaps we should change the paradigm and uh, advancing a model of truly, truly carefully done informed consent uh, permit by protocol uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women to volunteer for clinical trials so that we can be actively protecting, uh, quote unquote, women through the research actively from the beginning so we don't always end up with this problem where you've got a licensed product that works for everybody except pregnant and, and, and uh, breastfeeding women. Okay, the third framework that I want to talk about is very uh, um, useful, I think, for understanding barriers and facilitators to any health intervention. This is something that was advanced by a group of researchers uh, based in Montreal, and I'm just going to call it by the first author's last name, Levesque, uh, which is a patient-centered access model that conceptualizes access at the interface of health systems and populations. In that last paper, they had listed, you know, access to health services for marginalized groups as, you know, a structural concern, and absolutely that's the case. When we think about access, I think a lot of people kind of hear, you know, money, right? They're thinking about financial costs of medications, perhaps access to uh, health services in general. Can, do you have some kind of insurance for it? And that's a really important part, but it's one of many, many parts. And what this uh, complicated diagram shows you is that if someone has a health care need on the left-hand side uh, and uh, they, we want them to achieve health care consequences from an evidence-based intervention like PrEP, there are lots of intermediate steps that occur that form part of the access pathway, including perceiving their needs, for care, healthcare seeking and healthcare reaching, healthcare utilization. And at the top of this diagram, you can see a whole bunch of A words uh, that catchily um, uh, characterize the characteristics of the healthcare system that would allow people to kind of move from one part of this access pathway to the next. And at the bottom, you see corresponding abilities that correspond to what people themselves would need to have in order to uh, be able to take advantage of those existing services. Uh, I'm not going to read through this whole thing, but I think if you, if you look at any individual step here, you can see that it's nice, nicely broken down into the components that are required. And I think it can serve as a really nice checklist in a way for us as we're designing healthcare interventions to ensure that our services are as accessible as possible, recognizing that access means many, many things beyond simply an ability to pay for a pill or an injection or what have you. Uh, and the last and final concept I'll talk about is the PrEP cascade. Uh, this is something that's, I think, in many ways related to that last one I just showed you. You might have been looking at that arrow and thinking, hey, that sounds a lot like a cascade. Uh, and of course, in our field, we're so familiar with the HIV treatment cascade, the 90-90-90 or 95-95-95 objectives that we have for ruling out antiretroviral therapy. The cascade is a way of thinking about the proportion of folks at each step of a pathway that have actually succeeded in moving um, uh, that far along. Uh, and by looking at how, uh, you know, at those percentages, we're able to understand where the major gaps are. And in this framework here that's uh, proposed for HIV prevention cascades in general, not just PrEP, you can see that the idea is to start with a priority population that would benefit from a prevention method like PrEP. And then out of those to calculate or, or measure uh, the proportion who actually are motivated 
to use it. That's based in behavioral change theory, IMB models, COMB models. There's lots of frameworks for understanding uh, behavior change, but motivation is really important. Out of those who are motivated, then we can actually look at how many are truly able to access the prevention method. We can use a lot of the components of that last framework I just showed you to break that down further. And then at the end, we want to see effective use. And remember that that effective use doesn't uh, end with the very first time they get a prescription. They need to be uh, continued on that uh, intervention like PrEP. There needs to be adequate persistence and adherence in order to start to achieve those public health benefits we're looking for. So uh, that's a, a framework. We can, of course, complicate this and break each of these steps down into multiple steps within a cascade, building on some of the concepts that were uh, mentioned already. I'm not going to walk through all of these, but I think you can appreciate how uh, that might uh, give you a more nuanced look at what's happening with PrEP rollout in a given setting. And I'm going to show you a little bit of, uh, of an example from my own setting. So in uh, urban uh, Ontario and British Columbia within Canada, so uh, some of the big cities, Vancouver, Victoria, Toronto, Ottawa, Hamilton, we have been doing a PrEP implementation project over the last several years for gay, bi, and other men who have sex with men that we call uh, PRIMP. And we conceived this PrEP cascade as part of our design for this work. Uh, this is an implementation science kind of portfolio of projects. And we said, we started with that first step of identifying a population that could benefit. We said, um, all right, we want uh, to roll out more PrEP in this population. Uh, let's assist and support health care facilities in identifying GBN who have objective high risk measures for HIV acquisition, syphilis, rectal gonorrhea, or chlamydia, using PEP multiple times, et cetera. And the implementation work was focused on helping those facilities make sure that they're systematically uh, recommending PrEP services to all of those individuals as they you know, made the diagnosis in their STI clinic, for example. But of course, that's not where the cascade ends. The person then has to accept that PrEP recommendation. They have to be referred to a PrEP service if they accept it. They have to show up at their first PrEP appointment. Uh, that's step five. Then they have to start the prescription and then they have to be retained. So that kind of maps onto many of those broader steps that I showed you in that last slide. And here's what our cascade looks like, at least at the level of the two provinces um, that we're looking at. Ontario is on the left, British Columbia is on the right. Uh, we're looking at you know, roughly one to three and a half thousand healthcare encounters over time in these two settings. Uh, and I know the font is very small at the bottom, but the, the bottom line is you can see we're not doing great. Right with with these uh, with this prep cascade over the years, uh, there we can say that a minority of healthcare encounters look like they're actually reach ending up leading to sustained prep use, which is uh, uh, really useful for identifying work that we need to do. But how does the cascade give us even more nuanced understandings than that? Well, there's lots of ways. Here is an example. When you look at the two jurisdictions, we can identify some health systems differences that may impede uh, or, in this case, facilitate care. So uh, on the right-hand side, you see I've drawn a red horizontal arrow because in the BC setting, we have not that much drop-off between the acceptance of the referral step, the referral to the PrEP service step, and then the attendance at the PrEP services step. And that's because uh, there are, a lot of those services are co-located in our BC setting, whereas in Ontario we have this drop-off with people not showing up at that PrEP um, a, a appointment that's been set up for them even after they have accepted that recommended uh, referral. Likewise, you can look at this cascade and see uh, that the biggest drop-off in both settings, and uh, this is replicated in many other PrEP cascades around the world, the biggest drop-off is in that early acceptance of the PrEP recommendation. People saying no thank you when people actively uh, recommend PrEP to them. And as a, a result, we've, we've known that for some time in our setting, so we built into the, into the work some uh, collection of program data to identify you know, what are the folks at that very moment saying is the barrier to them accepting that PrEP recommendation. And what we've learned is that um, a lot of the time, well, not a lot of the time, about 10% of the time people are saying no thank you because they already have a PrEP appointment, and that's great. I put that in green, but there's a number of other issues that I think are, give us ideas for what we need to work on. Very commonly, people not saying, uh, feeling like they're not at risk for HIV. This is a common theme. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, a common reason that people say no. Medication costs, that gives us some uh, work to, to do in terms of advocacy and, and, and changing our healthcare uh, reimbursement structures. Needing time to learn more about PrEP, concerns regarding potential side effects. And I would argue that this tells us very concretely what we need to work with those frontline providers on, making sure they have the tools to support people in addressing these very common concerns. Uh, and we've learned this through using the cascade approach to analyze what's happening. 
So I hope that this has given you some useful frameworks for thinking about this massive topic of uh, facilitators and barriers of PrEP. It's not intended to be exhaustive, but I hope uh, you've seen that the PrEP to need ratio may be a useful heuristic uh, metric for quantifying inequities in PrEP access. That barriers, of course, exist at multiple levels of that socio-ecological model, and that we can use this LIVEC model, the PrEP uh, cascade model, to identify specific opportunities for intervention along a cascade. And ultimately, here is me beseeching all of us to uh, play our part in promoting a sex-positive, stigma-free uh, set of messages around PrEP, uh, around its efficacy and safety, um, promoting this actively as a key intervention that we can uh, advance to, uh, to help end the HIV epidemic as we know it. So thank you so much. Thank you.